hope you guys can hear me well. Yep. All right, I'm going to start my clock. I know I'm going to be doing this for an hour. Right, welcome everyone. This is the uh, Pass High Availability and Disaster Recovery Virtual Chapter. I can't believe it's already August and in the next couple of months, Pass Summit. I strongly recommend that you attend the Pass Summit. Like what John said, it's the uh, it's the Super Bowl of SQL Server professionals, although I don't really know how football works. But again, um, I'm going to be there. I know John and, and Dave's going to be there as well. Catch up with us. SQL Saturdays, a great opportunity to learn. I was supposed to be in uh, Singapore for SQL Saturday, but I can't make it. Um, it, it. There's a lot of learning opportunities for us to really explore, dive in. I would strongly recommend it to take a look at Steve Stedman's Database Corruption Challenge. If you haven't looked at this blog post, I strongly recommend that you do that because, hey, um, he looks at and shows you a lot of different options for trying to fix a corrupted database. But in this session, I'm going to talk about the five things to consider when you're stretching your SQL Server failover clustered instances and availability groups to, disaster, to a disaster recovery site. Now, um, I want to point out and show you uh, my uh, my uh, blog. I write on a regular basis. If you have any questions, please use the uh, Q and A window and go to webinar panel. Um, I'm on Twitter, on LinkedIn as well, and more than happy to answer questions as we move along. Um, think of it this way: while the title says disaster recovery site, it applies to just about anything out there that is outside of your current data center, be it the cloud, AWS, Azure, Rackspace, third-party hosting provider, your own data center, uh, whatnot, it applies. So I want you to take notes. I want you to really uh, uh, um, write down some of these ideas and concepts because, again, it applies whether it's your own data center or somebody else's data center or even the cloud. I want to start off with a story. Uh, um, when we were growing up, my, my, my siblings and I were always assigned chores at home. <clears throat> like we have a checklist that my, my mom used to post in the um, in fridge, and we all would be assigned tasks, like take out the garbage, help with the yard work. We can't, unfortunately, we can't play until we finish our household chores. And at the end of the week, she would check that out and say, hey, you've, maybe you, everyone, you've managed to complete all the tasks assigned to you within the week, you're good, here's a reward. Um, reward could be anything, a reward could be watching TV or anything. Now in some cases, in some cases, and what we, what we uh, uh, tend to do is always look at that chart Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to make sure that the tasks assigned to us, uh, we manage to do and we manage to complete, of course, according to her standards, not ours. But, you know, it's a challenge. Try to keep up on a lot of these household chores on a daily basis. At one time, uh, I was asked, hey, did you do this? And I was kind of surprised when I was asked that question because um, when I was looking at my chart, I didn't quite see that item in my list of tasks. Take, take for instance, take out uh, recycled. Um, growing up, we don't really have the concept of what's recycled and what's not recycled, so we just put everything in there. So when somebody asks you, have you taken out the recycling, like, what is that? And so sometimes I end up uh, doing things or being aware of the things that I'm supposed to be doing when in fact I'm not even aware that I'm supposed to be doing them. And uh, the reason I say this and the reason I highlight this is when you see something like this, and this is a screenshot from, <clears throat> uh, from one of my uh, test environment where an error message shows up that says, hey, the Windows Server failover clustering resource control API, blah, blah, you start, to be, you start to panic. Now, if it's a test environment, it's fine, but when you see something like this in a production environment and you know that whether it's an availability group or a SQL Server failover clustered instance, you know for a fact that they're there for one reason, high availability. Okay. High availability. And when you do something, when you see something like this, you end up thinking, oh, is this going to affect the client applications connecting to the database? And the reason for that and the reason why we feel that way is because of what one of the quotes that I uh, got from Earl Nightingale is that whenever we are afraid, it is because we don't know enough. And I want to take 
the word afraid and replace it with stressed out. Whenever we are stressed out, it's because we don't know enough. We see a new error message prompt. Um, it's the first time we're seeing it. It's affecting our high availability database. Infrastructures, we panic. We get stressed out. And I, 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 I don't know if you, I freak out sometimes, especially if I know that it's a mission critical database. You start to sweat, you know, your fingers become sweaty and you don't know exactly what to do. And that's the thing, because when you know your SQL Server databases are running on top of a highly available system, you need to be aware of the things that you as a SQL Server database professional need to be aware of regardless of whether or not you're responsible for them. So let's start with a very simple concept. I wanna, <clears throat> I wanna start off with a traditional two node cluster because this is something that a lot of uh, 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 IT professionals are aware of. It's, it, it's been introduced as early as the good old days of Wolfpack. For those of you who know the code name Wolfpack, uh, would probably tell you how old you are, but the fact is it was the code name for Microsoft Clustering Service back in the good old Windows NT4 days. Now, let's take a look at the traditional two-node cluster and how it works. Whenever you run a SQL Server failover clustered instance or an availability groups in a failover cluster, this is how it works. An application connects to uh, uh, the SQL Server workload, again, be it a failover clustered instance or an availability group. You know, uh, because failover clustering provides you with a high availability, when one of the nodes fail, for whatever reason, power failure, hardware failure, um, the application gets disconnected, the cluster then moves the workload from the failed node to any of the standby available nodes and bring that uh, SQL Server workload online on that node. Of course, application gets disconnected as a side effect of it and if of course the application has reconnection logic can reconnect back to that particular workload. Pretty straightforward. Regardless of whether you're dealing with availability groups or failover clustered instance it's practically the same thing. Although availability groups were introduced in SQL Server 2012 and later versions the underlying concept behind it is practically the same because both of them still run on top of a Windows Server failover cluster. Now here's the thing, um, I find that whenever uh, presentations or workshops or any topic that talks about failover clustered instances or availability groups are, are, are given, what isn't commonly mentioned is this piece that I did not include in the first animation, in the first image. The, uh, the icon representing or the server representing Active Directory and DNS because under the covers up until SQL Server 2014 running on Windows Server 2012 R2, your Windows Server failover cluster is highly dependent on Active Directory and DNS. And under the covers this is exactly what's happening. Let's repeat the exact same um, process that we did a couple of minutes ago. SQL Server fails because of a broken hardware, but before it fails over, it actually checks for Active Directory and DNS. Those are the two checks that the failover cluster have to make in order to successfully fail over the SQL Server workload on any of the available standby nodes. And I've highlighted those with numbers because we're talking about the five things that you need to consider, right? So those are the first two things, and I'm going to dive deep into those uh, items. And I'm going to number those as well, in, in addition to the first two, the Active Directory and DNS, I'm going to number some of those items as well, like the quorum, or rather the heartbeat, rather, and, uh, not the quorum, the quorum and the application. So that's the five things. Active Directory, DNS, uh, Heartbeat, Quorum, and Client Application. These are the five things that you need to consider when you start deploying availability groups over clustered instances across multiple data centers, not just for local availability, but also for disaster recovery. And I'm going to dive deep into it uh, throughout the next 
45 minutes. Yes. So let's start off with uh, stretching that architecture. Let me take a step back. Let's stretch that architecture into your production data center, the one on the left, and your disaster recovery site, the one on your right. You know, separated by <clears throat> geographical distance, um, connected by your uh, uh, network service provider. And we're going to talk about those five things in the context of a stretched cluster or multi data center deployment. Let's start off with number one, authentication and failover. The one reason why I started off with introducing the concept of having Active Directory and DNS in this image is because of the fact that a lot of us SQL Server professionals and DBAs and even IT professionals, to be perfectly honest, um, are not aware of the role that Active Directory and, um, and DNS play in how your SQL Server running on a Windows Server failover cluster remain highly available. I've learned this the hard way. Uh, 2006, if I'm not mistaken, I was a data center engineer for uh, a global Japanese IT company. And uh, somebody decided, and we do patch Tuesday, somebody decided to patch the domain controllers. And we've got three of them, um, two in the production data center and one in the disaster recovery site. Somebody decided to reboot both domain controllers at the same time. Funny enough, I was responsible for patching the cluster, and because of the fact that, hey, it's, it's a cluster. You reboot one machine, everything works as expected, assuming that everything is configured properly. I've got quorum. I only reboot one machine. I expect SQL Server to fail over. Guess what? It did not fail over. A couple of minutes after the patch, uh, after the server was rebooted, we got alerts from our monitoring software telling us that the cluster is down. Realizing, of course, is the fact that when you fail over, it checks if Active Directory for authentication is available. Just keep in mind, all of the servers in the failover cluster need to be joined to an Active Directory domain. And just like computer accounts, your Windows Server failover cluster has its own virtual computer account in Active Directory. And when you start stretching your cluster across multiple data centers, production and ER, you need to consider how your cluster will authenticate within the Active Directory environment. And again, I'm, I'm talking about this in the context of Windows Server prior to Windows Server 2016 because uh, Windows Server 2016 introduced the concept of um, Active Directory independent failover clusters, which means you can build a failover Windows Server failover cluster without the need to have Active Directory. But again, as and up to Windows Server 2012 R2, this is still the case. Now, when you're failing over, <clears throat> and I mentioned this earlier, when you're failing over, you have to think about, hey. Is this object, this virtual computer object, already in the disaster recovery site? Let me take a step back. And if you look at those two servers on the right, because they still need to authenticate, you certainly don't want those two servers to be crossing uh, geographical boundaries just to authenticate. You want to make sure that you're providing an authentication mechanism on that part of your data center so that they don't have to cross uh, data centers in order to authenticate. And that's why I have another Active Directory con uh, uh, domain controller and DNS server on the DR site because I want those machines and eventually the Windows Server Failover cluster authenticate on that data center instead of crossing geographical boundaries just to authenticate. But the reality is there's more to it than that. And the reason I point out this uh, TechNet article from Microsoft is because it takes a certain amount of time for the objects within Active Directory to replicate. Now, I know you might be thinking, hey, aren't we supposed to be talking about SQL Server here? True, but let me tell you the truth 
that you're now responsible for the things that you're not even aware are responsible for. I'm not saying you go ahead and become an Active Directory administrator, but keep in mind that your job as a database administrator is now dependent on Active Directory, and that's the reason why I'm pointing out the importance of what this is. And I'm highlighting three hours, that thing on the last uh, paragraph there. Three hours, it takes three hours for an object in Active Directory to, to be replicated across sites. And I'm not talking about data centers, I'm talking about Active Directory sites. Now, if it takes out three hours, how sure are we that the availability group listener or the failover cluster instance name is already on the DR site when we fail over to our disaster recovery site? Because keep in mind, if it's not there, whatever you do, will not be successful to bring that cluster online because it has to check if the object still exists or is existing and authenticate. If there's nothing there to authenticate, then too bad. It's no different from you trying to log into your computer but your account does not exist. It's practically the same thing. The only difference, of course, is this is a computer account that we're talking about, not a user account. But you can dial down, and not you, but your Active Directory administrators, you can talk to your Active Directory administrators to dial down the replication frequency be between Active Directory sites. And the reason uh, I'm mentioning this is because, keep in mind, you want to make sure that you meet your recovery objectives. What are your recovery time objectives when you're failing over to a disaster recovery site? Now, if that object isn't there, when you fail over, how long does it take for you to force replication, make sure that the object is there, it has to meet your recovery time objective, and that's why I'm highlighting this. I've actually, well, I've actually written a five-part uh, five series uh, blog post on, uh, on my blog about this, why Active Directory Domain Services Authentication Matters when you're deploying SQL Server Availability Groups or Failover Clustered Instances in a disaster recovery site, and that's how important Active Directory is in keeping your SQL Server uh, failover clustered instances or availability groups highly available. And this is also the part where I segue into saying, take good care and be nice to your Active Directory domain administrators because your job is very much dependent on those guys. So that's number one. Number two is Active Directory integrated DNS zones. I was just talking to a customer earlier today where, and, and, and uh, they've been a customer of mine since yet, uh, last year, and um, they were testing out something, and because it's a multi-site uh, cluster, it's an availability group with um, uh, replicas in different sites or different data centers, they have multiple virtual IP addresses for the same listener name. Unfortunately, what they did was they deleted the virtual IP address from the cluster and manually deleted the object or the virtual IP address in a DNS server. And then they uh, sent me an email asking, hey, how come this object keeps getting recreated when we've already deleted it and it's causing our applications to fail? Um, this is where I explained the concept behind integration with Active Directory, and Active Directory is responsible for talking to the DNS server for any change that you make. Um, there are a couple of parameters that you need to look at. Number one, register all providers IP. This is a property of the Windows Server Failover cluster that determines whether or not the IP address or all of the IP addresses are registered on the DNS server. Think of it this way. You got a production data center and a DR data center and you have an availability group. Your availability group listener name would have, in this case, two virtual IP addresses, one on the production data center, one on the DR data center, which means your client application, and I'm going to talk about the client applications later on, the client applications will see two virtual IP addresses. Client applications will then decide, which one do I need to connect to? Um, I want, again, I'll, I'll talk about that in detail, but just to give you an idea, if you turn, uh, if this is a property that can only be changed through Windows PowerShell at the moment, uh, a property that you can change on the Windows Server Failover cluster telling the, 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 the DNS to, hey, 
whatever IP address that I have, write it. If I got two IP addresses, write it on the DNS. Okay? Or you could change this to zero, which means only the active virtual IP address gets registered on the DNS. Now here's the thing. The cluster is actually telling Active Directory at the same time communicating with the DNS. That's where the Active Directory integrated DNS zones come in. Okay? Now, the default value for this is 20 minutes, which means any client application connecting to the DNS server asking, hey, what's the new IP or is there a new IP, would have a 20 minute interval, which means it will have to wait for the next 20 minutes in order to find a new value for a multi-subnet or a, a multi-data center deployment, that would mean, oops, that would mean if you fail over to your disaster recovery site, the client application needs to wait for at least 20 minutes in order to check, is this virtual IP available? If it is, I'll connect to it. If not, I'll try the next one. And this, again, going back to your recovery time objective. Will this value meet your recovery time objective when you fail over your availability group or fail over clustered instances to your disaster recovery site? If it does, fine. If it doesn't, make sure that you talk to your DNS administrators as to what the correct value, an appropriate value is to meet your recovery time objectives. The other, okay, the other, um, the other parameter which uh, uh, points to the host record detail is 20 minutes is the time host record detail, the seconds to be set for the cluster resource record published for the cluster name, which means, again, uh, this is tied back into what I mentioned about 20 minutes. The TTL value is 20 minutes, again, making sure that it does meet your recovery time objective when uh, you fail to reach your disaster recovery site. Now, a lot of these are things that we don't pay attention to in the past because we're simply looking at local high availability in a cluster where your nodes are in the same data center, you're only going to be dealing with one DNS server or multiple, but the, the replication is so fast that you don't even notice. Um, and you're going to be dealing with uh, uh, fewer hops to get to the destination. And when I say fewer hops, fewer network hops from the client application to the, the cluster in a single data center deployment. Now that you're dealing with a multi-data center deployment, there are going to be multiple hops and the behavior of how the client application will connect to the uh, a cluster resource will depend on the number of hops and in this case will also depend on the host record TTL value. I've also written, a, a, this is actually part two of this, I kind of look at it this way. Um, I use the analogy where I'm, I'm delivering items to a grocery store, for example. I know exactly where the grocery store is. But then following month, they made an announcement that they're going to move to a different location, maybe a different state. And I don't know exactly where that is. And I only found out on the last day that they're going to be in there. Now, unless they tell me where they're moving, I have no clue at all where I need to deliver the goods the next month. This is what the host record TTL and the uh, register all providers IP parameters do. It tells the client application what the address, in this case the virtual IP address, uh, needs to be registered in order for the client application to know exactly where to look for that resource in the future. I mean the future means failing over to the disaster recovery site. Number three of the three things that you need to consider when deploying availability groups or failover clustered instances in a disaster recovery site, the cluster heartbeat settings. Now here's the thing, because again in the past we're only, uh, we've only dealt with clusters within the same data center, we barely paid attention to this particular setting or settings in this case. You got, imagine this, you know, imagine you and your friend wanting to watch a football game or a hockey game or a basketball game and you know you're both coming out of work at the end of the day and you want to buy tickets and you coordinate with your friend hey I want you to send me a text message 
by the time you're ready to leave work. That way I know exactly how how far away from you, uh, you are from the stadium. That way I know when to get tickets, stuff like that. And so you decide, you communicate between your friend, your friend, or you send a text message to your friend, your friend receives the text message, and your friend responds back. Pretty simple, right? The concept behind a heartbeat is, what if? What if you don't want to miss this game? What if this is the game of the century and you want to watch it? And you don't want to miss anything in the game. So you tell your friend, look, we want to be there at this time, at this seat, <clears throat> excuse me, and making sure that everything we need is going to be there. You send a text message, he does not respond. Okay. 25 minutes after, you send another text message, he doesn't respond. And wait, the game is going to be in half an hour. You send another text message, and he doesn't respond. And you panic. Why? Well, you're going to miss the game. What do you do? Do you assume that your friend is just unavailable, he lost a phone signal, or he's just ignoring you for the fact that it's going to be the game of the lifetime and he's just ignoring you? And you panic. And this is exactly what the cluster settings are in terms of cluster heartbeat settings because the cluster's goal is to keep the resources in the entire cluster highly available. And what better way to do that is to ask every member of the cluster or every node in the cluster, how are you? Are you doing great? Are you healthy? Can you respond back to me? And the only way that the cluster will know is if the nodes within the cluster will respond to that particular message called the heartbeat message. It's for health detection, uh, especially for, uh, for uh, stretched uh, clusters. Now, Again, in the past, we barely paid attention to this because the network latency between nodes within the same data center is almost negligible to a point where you don't really need to make any changes to this. The same subnet delay property of the cluster for that, uh, uh, for that particular cluster is the frequency of heartbeat sent on nodes in the same network subnet. The default is one second, which means the cluster will send a message to all of the nodes every second, maximum of two seconds. There is another property that contributes to how the cluster behaves overall, and it's called the same subnet threshold, the missed heartbeats before a node is considered unavailable. Default value is five, which means the cluster or all of the nodes within the cluster will send a heartbeat every second for five seconds, five consecutive ones, and if any of the nodes in the cluster do not respond after five consecutive messages, the cluster panics, just like you when you don't get a text message from your friend after sending him five consecutive text messages every 25 minutes, you panic because you won't be able to see the game. In this case, the cluster will decide, hey, that node is not available, we'll consider that offline. Considering a node to be offline affects the availability of your cluster, which I will talk about later in number four of the four things that you need to consider. So the possible, in looking at those values, and this is the default value for a Windows Server failover cluster running within the same data center. The possible threshold before uh, a default threshold before possible downtime value is five seconds, which is why we barely paid attention to this in the past because network latency within the same data center is almost negligible. Five seconds, it's less than a second. Now, if your cluster just misbehaves as a result of a heartbeat uh, configuration setting, you know you have a big issue with your uh, internal network. Which is why, again, we barely paid attention to this and we barely thought about this. But now that you are looking at deploying availability groups or failover clustered instances with replicas and nodes on different data centers, you have to consider cross subnet delay. Practically the same concept as saving subnet delay, but this applies to nodes within different data centers.
The default value is 1, exactly the same as the same subnet delay. But you have to think of the network latency between, say, the United States and, let's say, Southeast Asia. That's definitely more than one second. And you have to fine-tune these values in order to not cause a false positive that the nodes in your DR site are unavailable. And you have to think of it in terms of, hey, what is our SLA in terms of your network service provider? What is the allowable latency? And what value can we use as an appropriate value that, so that it does not cause a false positive <clears throat> to tell the cluster, the cluster that some of the nodes are not available? Okay. And then there's the cross subnet threshold. This is the missed heartbeats before a node on a different subnet is considered unavailable. Exactly the same as the same subnet threshold, default value of 5, maximum of 120. Which means if we take the defaults and your production data center is in the United States and your disaster recovery site is in Southeast Asia, you have to think about what's the network latency and what's the default so what's the threshold in order, again, to not cause a false positive? Let's look at the default threshold before possible downtime value is five seconds. Now think of it this way, and the reason I paused was, what did your network service provider promise in terms of connectivity between your data centers? Because this value will be dependent on what your network service provider promised. I'm pretty sure that SQL Server is not the only traffic going through that pipe to your disaster recovery site. Your Active Directory workload, your um, SharePoint, you got SharePoint. Everything else in your network will have to go through that pipe. So you have to consider, again, the SLA, the uh, quality of service, and uh, again, these are some of the networking uh, stuff that your network service provider would have promised because this is what you're paying for in terms of uh, deploying these resources. So let's just put numbers in here to illustrate this point. If we use the default value for same subnet delay and same subnet threshold, it means that the nodes in the cluster within the same data center will have to wait for five missed heartbeats within a span of five seconds before a node is considered unavailable. That's the default value. Now let's dial down or dial up the values a bit for cross subnet delay and cross subnet threshold. I'm just going to use a random value here. Again, the values would depend on what your network service provider dictates what your network traffic shows, and this is where you have to be really in good terms with your network engineers because they know these values uh, uh, for the entire infrastructure. 3,000, which means three seconds, cross subnet threshold of seven, which means every three seconds, I'm going to send a heartbeat message to the nodes on my disaster recovery site, the nodes on the right side of, of, uh, of the slide. And if 21 seconds, I don't get anything from those, I would consider those nodes to be unavailable. I mean, the cluster, that is. And that would impact, again, the availability of your cluster. So when you change those values, you get a default threshold before possible downtime across subnet of 21 seconds. Good enough if you ask me. But again, that will depend on what your network service provider tells you what your network engineers tell you, because I certainly don't want to be um, uh, changing this for the sake of just changing it. So you have to strike a balance between meeting your recovery time objectives and making sure that you're not, <clears throat> you're not um, um, sending a lot of these heartbeat messages across the network. Keep in mind, though they are lightweight messages that are sent across the network, they're still messages that you are sending to the cluster nodes. So that's three of the five things, number three of the five things that you have to consider when deploying SQL Server, whether availability groups or failover clustered instances across 
data centers. And I call it the lifeblood across the wire because it's the heartbeat. It's what tells the cluster how all of the nodes uh, uh, are behaving, are they healthy, are they fine, and it definitely impacts the availability of your cluster. Number four has a lot to do with um, number three in, uh, in a sense because quorum and the quorum configuration and the way the cluster decides how the health is in terms of the nodes in a cluster, are, the quorum configuration is influenced by the heartbeat configuration. This is what I consider the most complex, yet the most important concept in a Windows Server failover cluster, the quorum. In fact, so important and so complex that I've created an entire mini course just for it. Because the behavior of the quorum is different between Windows Server 2008, Windows Server 2012, and Windows Server 2012 R2. Good to know that Windows Server 2016 will get the behavior from Windows Server 2012 R2. But just to illustrate the point, what is quorum, by the way? What about quorum? The concept, and to simplify the concept, it's just majority of votes winning, right? And when I say majority of votes, and you know, in a, a, I don't want, even want to go into uh, the voting and the election happening on uh, south of our border, but just the concept behind it is that if you have people voting towards something, 50% is not majority. Because you need somebody to split that decision. 51% is majority. So the idea here is if you get a number of votes higher than 50%, you get majority. Okay? And if you have majority, then the quorum can decide. In this case, the cluster can decide what to deal with it. By default, all of the nodes have a vote. You add a node to a cluster regardless of whether or not that node is a node in a failover cluster instance or that node is a replica in your availability group, it does not matter. It will still have a vote. Okay? And that's why you really need to be very conscious about the impact of quorum in your availability. Now, there are some debates about you know, the type of quorum that you need to use in a stretched cluster. Some would say, uh, even the failover clustering experts would say, hey, have a dedicated third data center and put your file share or your uh, 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 disk witness there. For me, that's just totally, I don't want to say it's totally nonsense, but for me, um, high availability is expensive. So you have to be very creative on how to lower down your operations costs while at the same time still meeting your recovery objectives. I'm a big fan of node and file share majority just because it's cheaper than disk witness, if you're looking at node and disk majority, because when you're looking at a stretched cluster and you decide to use node and disk majority where you're using a disk witness, you have to think about the add-ons that you have to buy from EMC, NetApp, HP, Dell, or all of those um, um, software, or rather a hardware, storage hardware vendors on how to do storage level replication. And that's not cheap, which means you're basically replicating a one gigabyte storage across your disaster recovery site. For me, again, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's not worth it. And this is where, uh, it's, it's one of the reasons why I prefer node and file share majority. And I know, again, a lot of, uh, a lot of available clustering experts would disagree otherwise. But again, my job is to strike a balance between cost and making sure that it meets the recovery objectives. What happens if you lose quorum? I got tons and tons of stories from my customers who complained when their uh, availability groups went down or the failover cluster instances went down because they lost quorum. Of course, that really depends on the version of Windows Server that you're running. Server 2008, different behavior. Server 2012, different behavior. 2012 R2, also different behavior in terms of the quorum configuration. Now, I would 
strongly recommend that you deploy Windows Server 2012 R2 as the underlying server operating system for your clusters. Not because I get commissions from Microsoft whenever I do the recommend. I don't. I don't. But it reduces your risk when it comes to high availability and disaster recovery when your quorum goes below majority. Okay? Because the goal is to keep majority of votes in order to maintain your cluster highly available. Now, again, Windows Server 2012 R2 has a lot of those built-in features like dynamic quorum, dynamic witness <clears throat> features that you can take advantage of to make sure that even if only one voting member is maintained or kept alive in case of a disaster, it will not force the entire cluster to go down. Now, a follow-up question, as I mentioned, a follow-up question that a lot of people ask, so where do you put your witness? If you decide to use file share witness, where do you put that? Again, some people would say, come up with a third data center where you put the file share witness. Again, for me, as far as I'm concerned, it's not cost effective. It doesn't make sense. I don't want to be paying Amazon or Rackspace or, uh, or, or Azure or anybody else just to maintain that file share witness because I'm not just paying for the, uh, the uh, subscription to the cloud <clears throat> offering. I'm also paying for the network connectivity. I'm also paying for operations costs and operations include monitoring. You got to monitor that file share witness overall uh, to make sure that you know when it goes down you get alerted so that you know how to respond. But here's my rule of thumb. I put my witness, whether it's uh, a disk witness or a file share witness, in the same data center as what I'm trying to protect. Why? My first goal is high availability. My second goal is disaster recovery. I certainly don't want my cluster to go offline because I lost the majority as a side effect of my file share witness going down because it's on a different data center. I don't like that. And so again, my rule of thumb is to put the witness in the same location as what I'm trying to protect. I might be thinking, well, what if I combine failover clustered instances that use shared storage and an availability group for my DR data center that does not use shared storage? Because you can have a failover clustered instance for your production data center and an availability group replica as a standalone instance on your disaster recovery site. Well, you could use a disk witness because you already have shared storage. Use that and be ready to come up with what I call, or what Microsoft calls, asymmetric witness. This is not allowing the failover cluster to have two witnesses, it's just a standby file share that you can automatically configure as a file share witness in case you need to failover to your disaster recovery site. And of course, I certainly don't want you to be manually doing this. This could be done using Windows PowerShell. You can automate the process Poof, and make it available in case you need to fail over your disaster recovery site. And like I said, this topic in itself is a very complex, very complicated, but very important topic to cover in less than 10 minutes, which is why I uh, created an, uh, an entire mini course just to explain the different behaviors of Windows Server failover clustering uh, depending on the version of Windows Server why file share is different from a disk witness, what's the, uh, uh, what's the concept behind partition in time. These are all contributing to how your cluster behave and how it would determine whether or not to keep a cluster online or to take it offline because it lost majority. Again, for number four of the five things that you need to consider when deploying SQL Server availability groups, I've written that uh, as a blog post as well, so you could uh, get back to it and just refer to that. I've also provided a couple of resources uh, about, um, about how the quorum behaves. But the one thing here that uh, I wanted to highlight is that um, in my online course there, I actually highlight some behaviors in a failover cluster that's not documented anywhere. I don't know if somebody opened a connect item for it. I know somebody uh, did complain about in the past, but there are some intricacies 
as to how the cluster behaved that is not officially documented, but it's just how it behaves. Um, and like I said, I've included that in my online course. But we finally come to number five of the five things that we need to consider um, to uh, whenever you're deploying availability groups or failover clustered instance to a disaster recovery site. Number five is all about the client application. Why? Because just like my analogy earlier about the DNS time to live and host record TTL, if I were to deliver something to a grocery store and not realizing that the grocery store is no longer there, it would take me a while to find out where the new location is. And finding out where the new location is could be easy, could be difficult, but the idea behind that is it's not just about finding where the new location is. It's how quickly can you find where your new location is because the word quickly defines your recovery objective. I'll give you an example in this case. If the location connects to the SQL Server instance on the uh, production data center, the one on the left. If the virtual network name does not exist yet on the client's DNS cache, the application will utilize the DNS client cache. <clears throat> First thing that it needs to do is it will ask DNS, hey, do you know exactly where this server name is located? The DNS server responds, gives back the virtual IP address for that particular virtual network name, and the client application starts reusing that. Recall our conversation earlier about the host record DTL. Every 20 minutes, the client application will do the exact same thing, but if it's already in the record, it will first check that. But what happens if you cause an issue, say your entire production data center goes down? Now, the client application will do the exact same thing. Let's say <clears throat> you decide to fail over, you manage to bring your SQL Server failover clustered instance online on your disaster recovery site, and you want to make sure that the client applications can connect to your disaster recovery site's SQL Server instance. Of course, the idea there is you have to make sure that the client application also resides in your disaster recovery site. So you're not just replicating your databases, you're also replicating your applications. Now, because it's on a different data center now, the application will do the exact same thing like it did earlier. Ask the DNS. Um, I can't seem to find this virtual IP address. Can you give me a new virtual IP address for uh, for the same virtual network name? The NS server response, and the client application now uses that the virtual IP to connect to SQL Server. Same virtual network name, different virtual IP address because now it's on a different network subnet. Again, this is definitely connected to uh, the number two item that we talked about, where we talked about the DNS. And it's now important for the application to know exactly where to look for this exact same SQL Server virtual network name, or listener name, or instance name, whatever you want to call it. And this is where the multi-subnet failover equal to true connection string parameter becomes very important. Now, this compared to the first four, this change might require additional resources. The first four, well, if you're the network administrator, you can easily do this. You just sub submit a change management request. If you're the SQL Server DBA and somebody else is responsible for it, you can always ask them to do it. Pretty straightforward. But when it comes to making changes to the application, this is where it starts to become challenging because, well, you have to talk to your data, uh, uh, application developers. They need to make the change. They need to test. Really, they have to test the application rigorously, push it to QA, test it on QA, and then promote it to production. Which is why this is kind of like the last thing that I recommend that they make change because of the restrictions and the resources. But they will have to at least use the .NET Framework 4.5, SQL Server 2012, and higher the SQL Server native client. Uh, JDBC, I forgot what the version number is, but it's it's on our, my blog. Um, and you also need to make sure that you test it. Um, like what I mentioned earlier, I was just talking to a customer where they wanted to use multi-subnet failover equal to true in their connection string, but they're not 
quite getting it because the client application still connects to the virtual IP address that got deleted. And the purpose, uh, the reason for that is, of course, they uh, they did not properly delete the uh, uh, the DNS entry. Um, but there's a whole gist of, of, of the complicated uh, cases behind that. But again, that is the role of the multi-subnet failover. Instead of waiting for 20, 20 minutes, it will cache the virtual IP addresses for uh, for the same network name, connect to the first one. If the first one does not respond, connects to the second one. If there's a third one, if the second one does not respond, connects to the third one, and so on and so on, which means it will be a lot faster for the client application to find out where the SQL Server instance is after a failover to your disaster recovery site. And again, as I mentioned, um, the version of the JDBC driver, SQL Server native client, uh, the .NET framework are in this particular blog post. Now, you might have noticed there's really nothing in here that has anything to do with SQL Server. I didn't show you Management Studio, I didn't show you the database engine, I didn't show you any T-SQL statement, nothing. But these are parameters, attributes, that impact how SQL Server maintains availability. And in some cases, we may not be the one responsible for doing those. Maybe it's your domain administrator, your network administrator, your DNS administrator, or on, in the case of the last item, it could be your application developers. The reason I highlight these is because, again, our jobs as SQL Server DBAs and SQL Server professionals are now dependent on the things that are outside the scope of what we do. So we need to properly communicate these five things to the people involved, your Active Directory administrators, your DNS administrators, your network engineers, your application developers, because, again, in large organizations where you've got segregation of duties, the SQL Server DBAs might not have the permissions to do these, like if the server administrator is not the same as the database administrator, we well, have to make sure that you properly communicate this to your server administrators. And at the end of the day, it's really all about meeting your recovery objectives because the recovery objectives don't just apply to the database. I mean, a lot of the times I tell my customers, it doesn't really matter how good of a SQL Server DBA you are. If the customer could not get to the application, they just say it's unavailable. I kind of use the analogy when you're buying stuff off of Amazon and when you click on add to cart, you get a 404 page. You don't say there's something wrong with the database. You just say it's unavailable. Because your recovery time objective is not just for the database, but for the entire infrastructure, which also means that you need to get your entire team on board on the same page in terms of what your recovery objectives and your service level agreements are. Like I said, it doesn't really matter how good of a DBA or, data or an IT professional you are, you can bring the database as, as quickly as you possibly can. If the customer can access the database, it is technically offline. It's a perception thing. That's why you need to properly communicate these concepts, these items, these parameters to the people who are involved. Now, if you're the one responsible for it, you need to make sure that you implement these changes to meet your recovery objectives. Let's open up the floor for questions. If you have a question, uh, questions regarding these topics, I would strongly recommend that you ask those questions in the Q&A section of GoToWebinar. All right, everyone is still around here. Definitely feel free to type in your questions as we're waiting for some to trickle in. I'll start one off here for you, Edwin. You, you mentioned what looks like a lot of great articles that you've written. Where would everyone that attended today's webinar or watches this on the recording later be able to find those? Great question. Um, they're all on my blog. Uh, I could create a short link that uh, gives you access to all those without you having to search for my blog, but they're all there. The five things that you need to consider when deploying SQL Server availability groups for failover clustered instance in the disaster recovery site. And okay. the address of my blog is there, uh, uh, the first line item there in uh, the slide. Perfect. Yeah, for the recording, we'll, we'll add a link to those in the, in the comments section up on the YouTube channel. 
All right, if anyone has any questions they would like to throw at, at Edwin about stretching your, your HA and DR plans, feel free to throw them in there. Currently, we don't see any out there in the queue, so we'll, we'll give it a minute or two here. Hey, for everyone, I really appreciate you taking your time off of your busy schedule to learn about how to, uh, uh, how, you know, some of the things that you need to consider when you're deploying availability groups or failover clustered instances on a different data center. Again, I really appreciate uh, you being on this webinar. Yes, thank you, Edwin. It's, as always, we, we love having you here and love your presentations that you give out to the community. We got a couple of people are saying thank you through the. Yes, thank you. Alrighty, so with that, we'll go ahead. We'll stop the recording here.